So how, how many of you have um, some sort of an idea about what is, uh, what is knowledge management? Do you want to just uh, maybe say a sentence each or something? What do you, what do you think knowledge management is? Sure. Uh, this is Sean. Yeah. Uh, uh, always considered knowledge management to be, um, as opposed to kind of information or data management, to be more capturing. Um, I've always considered it to be capturing sometimes the informal sources of information. For example, the experiences uh, in an office that um, that staff have that aren't necessarily documented in any other way. And which you happen to lose when you when the staff member leaves or moves on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Any other the opinion on knowledge management? Yeah, I've always thought of it as sort of a more corporate environment. Sorry, I, I, can you speak up louder? Yeah. I've always thought of it as more of a corporate environment issue, um, something that has to do with things in an office more than they would like a personal knowledge. Okay, okay. Any any other thoughts? Jay, do you have any uh, do you have any thoughts? On what is knowledge management yet? Um, my general sense of it is was actually captured really well by what Sean and Allison said. Thank you. Thank you. I think, and what uh, what Addison uh, mentioned was that it's it is applicable more to the corporate environment. And I think uh, rather than the word applicable, right, it, it has been used more in the in the corporate environment so far. But it is applicable to a wide range of settings, including in nonprofits and any libraries, archives, and museums. And also, the the more I think about it, I think it is applicable to communities and to society in general, and to professional associations, so to all kinds of places, because you find that uh, knowledge thing is being lost in a lot of places. You can find that in families too, like when, when people get older and a lot of the times that knowledge is lost to them and it is not passed on to the current generation or captured by them. So you can apply that in, in a family, you can apply that in organizations. So there is this, uh, I tried, I tend to look at it in terms of mentorship. If you think of mentorship as, as something that you, that you teach other people what you know, I think that sort of uh, captures the idea of knowledge management uh, pretty well. In, in terms of uh, being able to transfer uh, the knowledge held by inner minds uh, to other people who can use that in some useful manner. And uh, a lot of people have this uh, problem with the word management because if we think that knowledge is something that resides in our heads, then the idea is that how can you really uh, manage that? So rather than calling it knowledge management, uh, I, I, I tend to look at it as uh, what can I do to make your life uh, easier than what it is? And if you ask people this question, right, I think that is what knowledge management helps in terms of trying to bring in processes and uh, procedures and tools in order to make your life better. And the way you make your life better is that uh, you create a culture and an environment where you feel free to tell other people what you do not know. And then other people can help you in what you know. And also in terms of what you know, you can easily share your uh, your know-how, your ideas, and your also in your documents and artifacts that, you, that you've created with other people. So, so that entire process uh, is, is a part of uh, knowledge management. So I have a little uh, figure out here which encapsulates my, my research area. And I think this also goes well, very well with this course that you're taking, which is theories of information science. So here, uh, there's this, uh, at the center of it is this person, right, which we can call the actor or the, or the user. And this person could be, the, the Brenda Derwin uh, calls this person uh, Miss Squiggly or Mr. Squiggly, and this person is kind of a, uh, she calls it a body, mind, heart, and spirit, moving through time and space with some past history and then some, some present uh, work that person, this person is doing and some future dream. And this person could be a knowledge worker in some company or in, in, a, in any other setting. This person could be a physician, could be a, an LIA student, a library employee, or could be a, even a child, a toddler, or, or a preschooler. And this person, uh, uh, has some need for information which can arise either out of curiosity or because this person in, is in some uh, work environment uh, or, or the way wrong was asking you to work on an assignment uh, or, or that you have to make a final presentation in, in a class. So all of those give rise to need for information and you start looking for information. So let's say for your oral history, you, you reached out to information scientists and, and people who are professionals in the field. And based on that, uh, you start uh, getting this information 
and you can look for information from uh, friends or colleagues, uh, like co-workers in an organization or from family, and you can reach out to them either face to face or through the through email or through instant messaging or video or audio calls. And uh, you can also go to a library for books uh, or you can get information uh, online through information search and, and retrieval mechanisms and uh, you can access them through either your a desktop, a laptop, a smartphone, a tablet, and so on. And as you get this information, uh, you, you try to make sense of the information. Some some amount of your curiosity is, is answered. And sometimes you have more questions uh, than answers. And then you the some amount of a gap is filled. Um, gap is a term used by Brenda Derwin. Um, <clears throat> then you have uh, Nick Belkin who calls it an endless state of knowledge. And so, so there are different... Uh, terms to denote this need and you start looking for this information again depending on whether your need is satisfied or not and to the extent to, to that which is satisfied and sometimes you find this, this information serendipitously so all of these uh, are areas that you have seen in various parts of the class uh, in, in different uh, lectures and uh, then this need arises in in, in a certain context and uh, so I just had uh, this book that I that I wrote recently this is on uh, this context of information behavior and we discussed that in the online call that we had and this is also accessible uh, through the library. And uh, so this is the part where, if you look at information seeking and information behavior, right, you're really looking at uh, an individual's point of view. So the individual here is a user. But what if you uh, started looking at uh, the same phenomena, not from an individual's point of view, but from an organization's point of view, or a society's point of view, or a community's point of view? And that is where knowledge management comes in. So knowledge management uh, looks at similar processes um, but in this case, rather than a person uh, looking at uh, looking uh, seeking knowledge, then you seeking information. You call it uh, knowledge sharing over here. And uh, so, when you're looking for information from friends or colleagues, and you look at the other side, look when you look at the source of information, the information source. So that person is sharing the information, uh, uh, sharing the knowledge that this person has. And these uh, these books and these manuals and these things that are in the library, those are various artifacts where the knowledge has been codified which helps this uh, person make use of knowledge. So <clears throat> the individual's need and, uh, and use of information is actually at the knowledge application phase of the, in terms of the knowledge management perspective. So a very simple way to think of knowledge management is that uh, if, you, if you think of an, any organization, uh, a library or archive, right, you find that most of the employees, most of the knowledge walk, walks into the door at, uh, let's say, 9 a.m. or 6, 7 a.m. or whatever time the library opens and then walks out at uh, at 6 p.m. or the time when the library closes. And sometimes when people leave, then uh, whatever knowledge uh, that is held in those people, uh, that is lost to a large extent. Uh, and that also happens when, when people pass away. Uh, very recently, we, we lost a valued colleague, uh, uh, Professor Jim Matarazzo, and he was a great resource of knowledge, and he has written uh, various articles and uh, and books, and, so, so, and he also has uh, some videos that are captured. So a, a large amount of... Uh, what was in his mind uh, has been captured in those artifacts. But he knew much more than uh, what was captured. And that amount, uh, what, we call, what could not be captured, is lost with him. And, and, and that happens with people, and that also happens with uh, people leaving an organization. Uh, and from an organization's point of view, or a society's point of view, or a family's point of view, right? you have to think of processes and, as, and, and ways in which you can capture what is held in people's uh, head in, in various ways so that that information or knowledge is not lost. And those become intangible uh, but useful organizational assets. So the, in the talk today, we will do a few things. We'll look at what knowledge management is. Uh, I'll try to keep my slides small and I'll go through some of the research papers that I have uh, in this area. <clears throat> we'll look at the types of knowledge and recognize the typical model for knowledge management. Uh, we'll look at what phases of the, of, the, of the knowledge management cycle mean. And then from, through research papers, we'll look at uh, some technology and non-technology based tools for different phases of the knowledge management cycle and, and some way of uh, implementing knowledge management. And this part of implementing knowledge management happened because uh, when I first taught this class, uh, I think sometime in, in 2012, uh, what happened was that uh, a student asked me saying that we have finished this entire class, but I still do not know how to manage knowledge or how to implement knowledge management. And that is when I felt the need to have some sort of a paper because most studies will tell you that there is no silver bullet or clear, more clear-cut way of implementing knowledge management. So then I wrote this paper with uh, Professor Ndalala Maru from Kuwait University to try and have some stepwise procedure 
whereby people can follow that and implement knowledge management uh, in any setting. So in this case, we talked about uh, implementing it in, in colleges and universities. So yeah, so, so when asked, like most company executives say that their greatest asset is knowledge, which is held by the employees. And they will also tell you that uh, they have no idea how to manage this knowledge. And then we uh, implemented in various ways. Uh, for instance, in, in Simmons College, right, when we had uh, uh, our current provost, uh, Katie Conway, when she joined uh, newly, she did some really interesting things. Uh, uh, she started something uh, called faculty lunches. And in those faculty lunches, uh, faculty from uh, different uh, departments or schools in Simmons uh, could get together and, and have lunch on certain times. So food is, is really great in the sense that it brings people of various types together. And uh, through those lunches, uh, what, it, what, what happened was that a lot of people started talking to each other, even in those people who had no other opportunity to talk to each other. And by having that mechanism of lunches, uh, it did lead to some cases of collaborations in teaching or research in, in some people. So when you think of, of knowledge management, you have to think, think of uh, how can you bring about this diffusion of information and knowledge whereby you bring people together in informal and informal settings whereby they can uh, work together and, and transfer information because the idea of uh, knowledge is that knowledge uh, no, knowledge is created in two ways one is through the process of understanding when we read something when we uh, when we assimilate something then through introspection we create knowledge in, in our minds but uh, something interesting also happens is that knowledge is also created in the process of sharing. So right now, as I'm trying to, to tell what, uh, what I have in my mind to you, then that process creates knowledge as well, R apart from the, pro the, from the process of uh, reading, because you, any question that you ask or any comment that you make, right, uh, might get me to think in different ways in which I, I might not have thought before. So the sharing is a very important process of uh, knowledge creation. So that is why in an organization, you have to create uh, mechanisms for people to, uh, to share share knowledge and also for mechanisms for people to introspect and create knowledge individually as well as in groups and teams. And if you think of uh, this whole idea of the, or the, or the difference between information and knowledge, then, then I like to quote uh, Brenda Derwin over here because she she has this idea of uh, the of information being being a brick uh, as that most people think of information as a brick which I which when I throw at you you expect you to catch it. And then if you miss it, then, I, then I'd say that you, the bucket that you have, that's your heads, uh, those are, are leaky buckets or incalculatrent buckets in the sense that you are repelling the knowledge, the information that I'm trying to give you. So, and which she saw, says it's, it's a flawed mechanism and that uh, sense making is this process whereby what I'm telling you is, is just information, but knowledge is something that you are creating right now in your heads, whereby you're taking the information which I'm giving you and then you're trying to to take that information and then connect that with other pieces of information that you have based on the knowledge that you've gathered through your reading and experiences and interactions over the years. And you accept some of it and you reject some of it. So that is the process of knowledge creation. So anything that we give, right? Uh, any any person uh, that is give, that you that tells you something is basically just giving out information. And any book that you read is just, uh, uh, just a series of words or or what Derwin calls it, information caves in a way, or, the, or a library is like a big cave. So in the sense that, so those are places where information is kept, but the knowledge creation just happens when you try to make sense of it in your heads. So knowledge management can be seen as an attempt to recognize what is essentially a human asset, uh, which is which is the knowledge in your minds, buried in the minds of individuals, and how to take that knowledge and to leverage it into an organizational asset. So how can you take something which is very personal, what is, what is inside hum, people's minds, and to create and to recognize the importance of it and to create the and to take it all together and to create this huge uh, asset for the entire organization that, that can be used by a broader set of individuals on whose decision uh, the firm or the organization or the uh, depends so what i what i realized is that uh, it is uh, it, it is a very difficult process so so in the past uh, i i did my phd in singapore and also stayed there for 14 years when i was working there and and I did my undergrad there as well. So during my PhD years, uh, I worked with my advisor and, and we created a tool called KCOM or, or a knowledge community. And uh, in that, the, the idea of that tool was that we would ask people uh, some set of simple questions. So five things that you're good at, five things that you are uh, that you are passionate about, 
and and five things that five things that you experienced in. So through those series of simple questions, uh, uh, what we aim to do was to have uh, a very simple case of trying to capture the expertise of a person in the, in, in the form of a system. But again, we, f we found that uh, the tool was not very effective because it did not have a, have a huge community. So in the current age, uh, any tool is only successful if you have a community of people using it. So the, the reason Facebook is, is so successful is because it has like one or two billion people using it. And otherwise, there are lots of tools like Facebook, which may not be as successful because it does not have a community behind it. Uh, in, a, in a similar example, uh, while I was in Singapore, we also developed a system called ETAP, which was a portal for school teachers and students in Singapore to share the PowerPoint slides and different kinds of educational materials that you've created with teachers from other schools. And we found that uh, the system was, was developed well. It had a, a good taxonomy that was used that was uh, developed by the Ministry of Education in Singapore. And uh, we hope that it will be very useful for, for all the teachers. And after about two years of having the tool live, we found that uh, when we talked to people, they all thought it was a very useful tool, but no one was really using it. And, and, we, and that's where we realized the, the problem of uh, having a technology-driven solution. And every time you think that uh, knowledge management is a that you, you, you build or design or buy a, a good tool and you make it available for a company or, or an organization, you think that you are implementing knowledge management and that's not the case. Because knowledge management, but tool is just a, an enabler for knowledge management. It's not the solution. The most important part is people and culture. And uh, in the case of school teachers in Singapore, we found that uh, nobody was really ready to share uh, what, what was in, in the minds because there were lots of issues. They were uh, and we ended up actually doing a, a study where we interviewed people and, and we did focus groups trying to identify the reasons why they didn't want to share. And uh, we actually found that uh, people were, not just that people did not want to share, but people were actually hostile to sharing. They were, we were, they were very closely guarding the information and knowledge that they had and the tools that, and, and PowerPoints and slides that they created. And uh, we used the lens of, uh, of a theory created by My Michael and Han and uh, I forget the last name of the the other author. I think it was Haskellova. Uh, so so both of them. Uh, so they they had this uh, this theory, and uh, it was a knowledge sharing hostility theory. And you find this in various organizations. That uh, you will find that there are, there are a few types of organizations. One type in which uh, knowledge management really works well and, and thrives, and those are the places where knowledge management has succeeded. Like you'll find NASA and a lot of other organizations where there are successful st stories of knowledge management implementation, successful case studies. But there are a huge number of organizations where knowledge management has failed. And those are the organizations where, where people have thought that implementing a tool is a solution to knowledge management, whereby, but, it, but not, not correcting the culture. So when you want to implement knowledge management, uh, you have to think about, uh, I mean, what, it's not clear as what comes first. Knowledge, does knowledge management leads to a knowledge sharing culture or does knowledge sharing culture lead to success of knowledge management? So both of them kind of reinforce each other. So if you already have a knowledge sharing culture, the knowledge management really thrives well. And then you can have better processes and tools to help manage the knowledge. But if people are hostile to sharing, sharing people, if people do not want to share what they know, then it's very difficult to uh, go and implement knowledge management uh, in those organizations because um, then then you do not, people do not really have an incentive to share. So as the top management or people, uh, people who have some power in an organization, uh, you have to create uh, rewards and uh, reward mechanisms for sharing. Like uh, I was in, in the leadership role in, in ACIST, which is the Association for Information Science and Technology. And uh, I was a chapter assembly advisor, uh, chapter assembly director uh, for a year. And during that time, uh, different student chapters and regional chapters uh, across the US and, and in, in the world, they had to submit the annual reports uh, about what the kind of activities that they had, they had done. So one thing that I did as chair was to change the, the points system whereby when people submitted their, their annual reports for, for the chapter of the year award, they had to have certain, uh, we, had, we allocated a certain number of points where they had to demonstrate that uh, they had worked with other people uh, in, in, uh, in their uh, other other special interest groups or other chapters, and by doing that, what 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 we were trying to do is to inculcate a mechanism where people were rewarded for working with other with other chapters or other SIGs, and similar things can be done. Like even when let's say faculty go up for tenure in an organization, let's say in Simmons College, um, then we are we are expected to produce research, uh, 
uh, papers. And those papers uh, can be either single authored articles or co-authored articles. But let us say that we created uh, some some sort of uh, reward mechanisms whereby uh, we created a culture culture saying that a certain number of articles have to be uh, co-authored with either faculty in Simmons or with other people. Then what we are doing is that we are creating an incentive for people uh, to collaborate with with other people, and and those mechanisms can really help in uh, in knowledge sharing. And I found that happening similarly in uh, in Simmons right now, where where there is this uh, there's a research grant called. Uh, Called President's Fund for Faculty Excellence, and I applied for the grant earlier this year. And uh, when I looked at the criteria, it said that since Simmons has formed, uh, newly formed these four new colleges uh, in, in, in Simmons, so then uh, the grant said that uh, one of the, the criteria for awarding the grant would be to to demonstrate collaboration with uh, either within your 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 college or with other colleges in Simmons. So so that was uh, that I thought was was a very nice mechanism to. To basically foster this uh, this collaboration by rewarding that uh, by recognizing that as a criterion to award the grant or not. So when you think of uh, knowledge, right? There are two types of knowledge. Uh, one is tacit knowledge, and the other is explicit knowledge. So so this uh, idea of this image of an iceberg sort of captures that pretty well, because uh, when you think of an iceberg, right? This uh, there's this huge thing which is below the water, and only a very small part of the iceberg is that. Uh, is there above the surface. So tacit knowledge uh, can be seen as a knowledge of uh, how to do something. So when you think of uh, how to drive or how to swim, right, that's a kind of tacit knowledge. It's having some sort of uh, a know-how in our minds. And uh, th it, and you find that uh, a lot of the times we can, we know much more than what we can tell other people. And that part of what you know is the tacit part of the, the, the knowledge. And explicit part is, uh, is, is what we can tell, what we can record in terms of videos or, or books or, or manuals and in, or in knowledge sharing repositories uh, in systems. So that is the explicit part of knowledge. So whatever whatever knowledge that has been codified in books, uh, this, this process known, is known as codification, the, the process of transferring a tacit knowledge to explicit knowledge. And you find that uh, uh, in organizations, uh, one of the purposes of knowledge management is to, the, is to transfer this, this tacit knowledge into explicit knowledge. Because the more you're able to do that, the more, more a person's uh, tacit knowledge is, is then stored in the form of explicit form in organizations. But really, the, if you think of the whole knowledge sharing cycle, right, then, uh, then, the, then you look at the mechanisms of conversion as to what processes that can you create to convert or to transfer tacit knowledge of one person with the tacit knowledge of another person. And that can happen when you have uh, when you invite a guest speaker, let's say, to give a talk in your class. In that case, uh, that's a mechanism of transferring of tacit knowledge to. And when you try to make sense of that information in your minds, then that is again you're taking one person's uh, knowledge and you're trying to make sense of that in your heads and and forming knowledge in your heads. So that's the <coughs> of uh, tacit to tacit transfer. When you invite a person, uh, when you write a report based on on what you know, or when you let's say do online discussions, uh, then in that case you are taking your tacit knowledge and do, then you are converting that into explicit form. And the other thing that you can do again is uh, taking explicit knowledge and converting that to tacit. And that happens when, when let's say I take a book, right? And when, once I start reading reading that book, then that process of understanding is basically uh, trying to take explicit or codified knowledge and trying to make sense of that in my mind. So that, that mechanism is again, conversion from explicit to tacit. And uh, the, uh, the fourth is when you, when you convert from explicit to explicit what happens when you say let's say you have a written article in, and you try to write a summary of it or when you when you had this this assignment where you had to do like an annotated bibliography so, so that is when you try to make sense of written information or when you do like information visualization for instance you take information and then you try to visualize that so that is again uh, explicit to explicit uh, conversion so tacit knowledge uh, Helps, uh, helps, you, helps you deal with uh, exceptional situations. It, it, uh, it basically reflects people's expertise uh, and it helps, helps you collaborate with other people in culture. Uh, explicit knowledge is, uh, is easy to disseminate, disseminate with other people, easy to reproduce, uh, easy to access, and it also easy to systematize in, in, in some form. So it's, let's say an organization has a vision statement or a mission statement, right? That is a, some sort of an explicit uh, 
uh, knowledge that you have and that is easy to, tra to transfer to a lot of other people because tacit knowledge is often messy and subjective. <clears throat> Explicit knowledge is much more, more objective in a way. So this is a, a famous model by Nonak and Takeuchi. It is known as the, the knowledge spiral model. So there are lots of uh, theories and models of knowledge management. And this is known as a knowledge conversion model. And this is, so what I just uh, told you about the various conversion cycles um, that was, that was uh, proposed by Nonak and Takeuchi in this model. Tacit to tacit conversion of knowledge happens in this process of, process of socialization. And then you can do that through brainstorming and through coaching and so on. And uh, tacit to explicit uh, conversion happens through this process of capturing and, sh and sharing information. And uh, explicit to explicit happens in, in, when you combine information and knowledge and you classify things. And the whole the idea of information organization and classification that, that is basically looking at this explicit to explicit conversion of knowledge. And uh, the explicit to tacit is. Uh, is when you try to learn and when you try to understand, when you internalize uh, knowledge. So these are the four important phases of uh, of knowledge conversion in an organization. This spiral sort of continues. Uh, and when when all of these processes happen really nicely in an organization, then you can say that, OK, the, the knowledge processes are going on well in, a, in an organization. So one of the things you need to do to understand knowledge management is to convert, is to do a knowledge audit. So look at each of these phases and to see and to see that what are the mechanisms of, uh, let's say, socialization or tacit to tacit conversion that do we have in an organization? Do we have a lot of meetings where people get to meet? Do we have a lot of talks where people get to see each other? Um, what are the ways in which we, we get people to externalize the knowledge that, we, that they have? How do we capture the knowledge which is there in, in people's heads? So again, looking at the various processes and tools that you have in an organization and uh, doing the same for internalization are we providing incentives for people to have personal growth? Uh, do, do you send people for trainings? Do you have, what are the things that you organize for people to learn and to, and to grow further? So, so these are again, uh, an important uh, mechanism for, for internalizing knowledge in an organization. And again, do we have people uh, to mechanisms in an organization to further synthesize the knowledge that, that is created or, or, or is there in artifacts? Because what happens is that any, any amount of book or artifacts or repository that you have in an organization, right, that becomes stale if it is not used. It, it is just out there, but it's not really useful. So what are the ways in which you help people uh, re, reuse uh, and to make reuse information and to make sense of information which is already there in documents? Uh, like for instance, in Simmons, we, we store the syllabi of uh, past courses. So are there other ways in which are, there, are people actually using those syllabi or not? And what are the ways in which we can make uh, a wiki that you develop, let's say, to be more useful for people over time. And so by really the updating the documents and, uh, and getting people to, telling people about the resources that are there, uh, that, is, that is a very useful thing. So one of, the, one of the things we need to do when implementing knowledge management is to create mechanisms to connect people with people. So when you connect people with people, um, you create mechanisms for tacit to tacit, tacit uh, conversion of knowledge. And this happens very well when we have a mentorship mechanism. Let's say you assign each person to a mentor then, then that becomes a really good mechanism for people to reach out to someone when, when you do not know what is happening or, or to or, or for times when you're lost. But that person may not be able to answer all your questions. So we also need to have uh, resources that are, that are there in which you create short videos, let's say, or you have a frequently asked questions. So this person can actually tell you that, okay, where, where can you go for information? So we need both uh, tacit to tacit, uh, both the uh, mechanisms for, for in an organization to reach out to people's tacit knowledge, but also mechanisms for, for us to reach out to people's explicit knowledge and resources that have been, been stored in the organization. So these are the key phases of a, of a knowledge, uh, knowledge cycle in an organization. So one of the phases is basically the capturing knowledge. Uh, what, are, what are the mechanisms that do you have in an organization to capture the knowledge uh, that, that uh, your, your employees have? But also the knowledge that that people external to your, to your organization have. Let's say what are the best practices in the industry or the field, and mm -hmm. uh, that is the knowledge capture part. The second part is knowledge creation part. Every time we as faculty, let's say we write research papers, or when you as students when you write when you create a poster or when you create an assignment, you are creating new knowledge in that process. And what are the mechanisms mechanisms do we have to for knowledge creation? What are the mechanisms do we have to to codify knowledge? Uh, that is taking this tacit knowledge and uh, taking that into explicit form and refining that knowledge, reconstructing knowledge. What are the me mechanisms for sharing knowledge with, with other people, for transferring knowledge, 
mechanisms for pulling the knowledge of a group of people into something uh, common. And so that can happen in the process of brainstorming into something. So let's say when we have day-long retreats uh, uh, to brainstorm future directions of an organization, so that is the process of knowledge pooling. And then uh, how can you organize the knowledge uh, which is there in people's heads? Uh, like uh, we we have a professor at uh, Kyungin Oh, she did her PhD research in the area of personal knowledge organization. How do people organize their files and folders on their on their desktops and PCs? So, so, so that was uh, for so both personal knowledge organization, but also organize, organizing their institutional knowledge that is held. And how can you like, how can you facilitate knowledge access in a, in an organization? Uh, and and in terms of this learning part where you're taking the explicit knowledge and trying to internalize that, what can you? What are the ways in which people learn knowledge? Are you are you taking care of people's learning styles in the process? Um, are, are we looking at, at modes in which people? Uh, what are the modes in which people prefer that knowledge to be used? So so, and this knowledge application in a way that goes very well with this entire idea of uh, information seeking behavior, information behavior, where the idea of individual comes in over here. So there, the individual knowledge, uh, uh, information seeking, and behavior goes very well with the knowledge application and transfer part of knowledge management. And then uh, also to evaluate uh, whether the knowledge that we have in an organization is useful or not. And sometimes, uh, and whether it's it's being reused. And one important phase is called knowledge divesting. Divesting is basically means getting rid of knowledge. So a lot of times, any kinds of resources that we that we hold, right, it has a cost. So in libraries, you, you find that a lot of times libraries read their, their books and resources. Uh, so in a similar manner, even with uh, the files and folders that we have, or the, or the let's say even the amount of Photos that you have in a, in a drive, or any any kind of personal or organizational knowledge, we need to divest it from time to time. Is to get rid of things which you don't no longer use because there's a cost to storing and maintaining and organizing it. These are some of the key phases of the of the of the KM cycle, but uh, the, there is this uh, there's Professor Kimis Dalkir. She wrote a, a good book on knowledge management, and 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 she basically came up with three key phases of the of the KM cycle. One phase she calls it calls a knowledge capture and and create and creation the second is knowledge knowledge sharing and transfer and third is knowledge application and use so if you look at those three key phases they kind of sum up this entire number of knowledge cycle phases that are there so now i do i just want to go through some of the papers that i have just so that you can see how knowledge management is uh, research is, is moving on so some of these papers are from 2014 and some are more recent um, and this is uh, this paper is called knowledge implementation in the library and what are the tools and technologies uh, that you can use uh, in order to implement knowledge management? Uh, so th let me go through some of these uh, papers. So this was, this paper was published in this journal called uh, Vine, which is uh, which is uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, I don't know the full form. I think this Vine has a. Let me see the Vine journal. It's called the Journal of Information and, and Knowledge Management Systems. It's an Emerald journal. And in this paper, uh, the purpose was to study, the, was to investigate the tools and technologies that would be of value to libraries as they implement knowledge management and to map these to different phases of the game cycle. And uh, what we found in the study was that there is no single set of tools that would be applicable to everyone all across libraries. In addition, technology is just an enabler for knowledge management. Therefore, a comprehensive set of tools, both physical and technological, is presented. So, the idea that here was that uh, when it, whenever we think of tools for knowledge management, right, there isn't. Uh, most people make a mistake by saying that okay, that we are going to buy this huge expensive system uh, for knowledge for knowledge management. Uh, and there are systems. There's a system called SharePoint. Some people use a free system called Box.net. So you can you can use various kinds of systems to implement knowledge management. But just having a system is not useful uh, if people don't use it. So you need to have a system which people are, are happy with, with comfortable. Like one such example is that's a Simmons connection. We have connection.simmons.edu, which initially I thought would be sort of a knowledge management system for, for Simmons College. And uh, But in the end, we find that it's not really used uh, a lot in terms of for, for knowledge sharing or transfer. Now, ACES, which is the Association for Information Science and Technology, has recently invested in a tool called uh, Communities. And through that community platform, um, it, it can, if people use it if, effectively, it can be a, a method for, for people to, to transfer the knowledge which is held by various uh, groups and communities within, within ACIST. 
So again, uh, the amount, the extent to which it will be useful will depend upon the way people adopt it. So, so in this case, uh, this paper first talks about the whole idea of what is knowledge management, how it is applicable in, in libraries. And uh, here when there's a literature review, there's a game cycle and models. So, so that it has the phases of the knowledge cycle listed over here and how different researchers have come up with various tools, various names for the various phases of the game cycle. And uh, this is the integrated cycle which Dalkir has, which she calls knowledge capture and creation, knowledge sharing and dissemination, or, or knowledge application and uh, uh, knowledge acquisition and application, which I revised it to knowledge application and use. So these are the various phases. Uh, so she has uh, the first phase is uh, knowledge capture and creation now, and then you assess that that knowledge which has been captured, and then you have knowledge uh, knowledge sharing and dissemination. Oh, this became too big. And and then um, you contextualize that information, and then you use that apply and use it, and then you update it further. And so, so sort of this cycle continues. So so the first part of the cycle here is uh, knowledge creation capture. Second is knowledge sharing and dissemination, and knowledge application and use. So I looked at these uh, three key phases of the KM cycle, and uh, so Anwar and I we were co-authors in this paper. Uh, he is. Uh, he was a PhD student earlier in the, the Japan Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, and now he is a, an associate professor in uh, Dhaka University in Bangladesh. So he and I have done a number of studies in, uh, in knowledge management, and uh, his area is KM in, in library as well. So here, uh, in, in this first uh, phase, we look at technology and non-technology based tools for KM for knowledge creation, capture, and then te technology and non-technology based tools for knowledge sharing and dissemination, and, and similarly, technology and non-technology tools for knowledge application and use. So here, uh, for the first phase, in terms of, two, let's say, tools for, uh, for knowledge creation and can capture, then there are various mechanisms uh, that you can do. Like when, in, in order to capture the, the tools and, and talk, that people have, right, you can, you can codify the knowledge that employees had through abstract representations or through having ad hoc sessions or having an, an, a review each time some action is, is performed. Or you can have brainstorming sessions, you can invite guest speakers, or you can have some sort of a knowledge cafe, which is a way for people to have a group discussion uh, to reflect and develop and share any thoughts and insights that they have. You can have uh, an idea of a knowledge marketplace, which could be seen as a dating service for knowledge that identifies what people know and what, what they need to know on a particular subject. And then you can have, let's say, the, an idea of uh, of learning from others or having learning history, some sort of a roadmap or ways for people to assist other peers. So all of these are various mechanisms in the literature for uh, capturing and codifying the knowledge that is, that is there by, held by people. So this is, uh, let me see if I can uh, rotate this, rotate pages clockwise, okay. So, so here, uh, in this in this case, uh, you know, the, this is this is a second table here, and apart from the non-technology tools, right? I, I wanted to look at technology tools uh, that can assist in uh, assist in, in this idea of uh, of knowledge capturing. So here, uh, one idea is is of, of co-browsing or sort of screen sharing and remote support. So so here there are. Uh, there, there are tools like Join.me or Firefly, GoInstant, uh, Skype screen sharing, like GoToMeeting, what we're doing right now in terms of screen sharing. So all of these uh, things can help in the process. Uh, collaborative uh, visual reviewing, again, you have Devo, uh, Review Studio, Notable, Google Drive, uh, PDF Exchange Viewer. So I'm currently I'm using this PDF Exchange Viewer right now. It allows you to uh, to highlight, annotate certain things, and you, you can you can you can tick and and you can type your your notes on it and so on. So, so, so these these are some some technology tools which can be useful. Then you have tools for collaborative writing, uh, tools for, for document sharing. Again, wikis and other tools listed over here. Microsoft SharePoint, and and tools for again uh, uh, for having knowledge community. So here I, I, I talk about this idea of KCOM, which was which was this uh, tool that we developed uh, in Singapore. I'm not sure whether it is uh, this link still works or not. And then uh, you can have tools for mind mapping and diagramming, uh, video recording, whiteboarding. Okay. So let me again rotate this.
So the second part is, uh, is, is, is basically when we go from the, the first uh, set was tools for knowledge uh, creation and capture. And second is second set is the tools for knowledge sharing and dissemination. So personally, I think that the most important part of knowledge management really is the idea of knowledge sharing. So even if you were to forget everything else, uh, a good job, uh, if you think of implementing knowledge management, then you can think of uh, ways in which you can make it easy for people to share knowledge. So that is the most important aspect, I think, of uh, of knowledge management or, or, or the knowledge sharing part of it. But here, what you can do, is if you look at non-technology tools, right, then you can embed knowledge management in the organizational human resources. So encourage knowledge management behaviors and overall culture change. So library staff, staff can be rewarded to share or in sharing, sharing knowledge, in, so incentivize uh, finding and adapting solutions from all of the library. You can have collaborative physical workspaces. So this part is really important. Uh, so even when you have, let's say, the maker spaces in a library, right? Um, the way your organization is laid out, that is a very important part of knowledge management. Uh, what I've found is that if you have, uh, if you want to create a, a culture where people do not talk to them too much, then hallways are a good design. Let's say right now in, uh, where you are sitting right now in the collaboratory, right? So this is the, the third floor of the Palace Road building, and you find that there is a hallway in, which leads to people's offices. So this hallway design is good when it when you want to have different departments and uh, different places, let's say when people can go on separately to their offices. But, but when I think of it now, I think the hallways is actually a waste of uh, space when you design design the floor of a building, because that hallway could have been used rather than, it could be a, a room kind of a common structure and then rooms could be built around it. If, if that were to happen, then it provides a common seating area for people and, and it becomes sort of a lounge where people sit. And then it, it provides us a, some sort of a people, pe place for people to get to know each other as they're going, moving into and out of the offices. And when that happens, right, you, you promote greater knowledge sharing. So and that is good for a place where there, where there is a greater cohesion with, between people and there is a knowledge sharing culture. And, and so, the, so the, how you design physical spaces is a, is a key part of implementing knowledge management. And when you want certain sets of people to work together, then you can co-locate their offices uh, together to have them sit next to each other. So, so that is a that's a very important part of implementing the, this sharing mechanism. And then you can have uh, communities of practice, a group of people who share a common interest. Let's say people who have uh, a common research area. Um, I think uh, Rong, I, Kyung Yun, and uh, and Chao Chin, we earlier came up with this. Rong, what was that uh, group that we called? Knowledge Info Hub earlier. Info Hub. Yeah, InfoHub. So InfoHub was designed as, as sort of a group of uh, faculty members and students who were interested in, in this area of, uh, of information use and information behavior and, and related areas. So, so that is a, a sort of, of a community of practice where we bring people with similar interests uh, together to do common things. And then we have this uh, directory of experts uh, where you can have uh, yellow pages or some sort of a skill mining. So Right now, I think this this is a, there's a great need of this. So let's say we have faculty in, in different departments in Simmons, and different people might know different things. Uh, so some people might have uh, expertise in qualitative research, and some people might have expertise with with a certain uh, tool called let's say NVivo, or or certain people uh, might have expertise in in statistical data data analysis. So a lot of the times, this information is very difficult to get or some people might be very comfortable with Moodle or, or certain technology tools. And even though people's research interests and teaching areas are listed in the websites, we don't have an easy mechanism for us to, to understand and to transfer the know-how that people have. So really to be able to, to have a tool whereby people can have uh, an easy update of, uh, of our skills and knowledge, that, that is very important to have a, a healthy organization where you feel, feel, will feel free to reach out to people who have expertise in, in different areas and to be able to capture that information. And then you can have tools like you can do social network analysis, or you can do storytelling. Storytelling um, is also a course in Simmons, uh, it's list right now, but it's a very important part of knowledge management where people uh, convey the information that you have uh, through this idea of telling stories. And the stories, uh, what you can do at the end of stories is that you can, uh, you can have a very simple form and you can have uh, every time something works well in an organization that can help uh, those stories can help inform best practices as to what, what worked really well in the past. And then you can have another kind of stories based on things that did not work well. And those stories can form the idea of lessons learned. So what did we learn from there and, and what, what future lessons can we learn in terms of what things don't well. So a good organization which has implemented knowledge management will have this mechanism both to capture best practices based on what worked well in the past 
and also to, be, to capture lessons learned based on what did not work well and to tie these down to the, the people uh, who can help you to give further insights into these stories as well as the resources that were created as a result of these. And uh, then you can have a, a set of technology tools again um, in this. So I'll rotate this page again. Um, so this is a uh, technology tools you, that you can do for knowledge sharing. You can have file sharing mechanisms, which can uh, have through, uh, through cloud, uh, cloud computing devices, uh, mechanisms such as Dropbox and uh, Google Drive and so on. Or you can have uh, a private social networks that can be created for organizations uh, like what uh, ACES is doing with the communities. So you can have this social cast uh, with every me next thing. Like right now, let's say the, uh, in SLIS, right, we have a faculty group called SLIS underscore faculty. So whenever we want to share something with the, within the faculty, we will send an email to this mailing list or this group. When we want to share something with uh, the entire SLIS, right, we have SLIS info. But these are uh, not very good tools for knowledge sharing because a lot of the times these are one-way mechanisms whereby you, you disseminate information through these through SLIS info. There's no easy way for people to, to all communicate well because the, the moment they do that, it will flood people's mailboxes. Uh, so then, Something like Facebook uh, is good because what you have is a wall where you share something on the wall and other people can uh, can like it or not like it or to see it and or to not see it. So it does not really flood people's mailboxes in that manner. So so you can have a certain similar mechanisms for instant chat and all in an organization as well. And so you have mechanisms for having instant chat. Uh, so these are various tools which can help in that. Uh, today's Meet is a, is, a, is, a, is a good tool for a back channel. So you can go to, let's say for instance, uh, when you go to um, todaysmeet.com, right? You can go here and you can create a room and that room can, can be for one hour or for one week. And then people can go to this today's meet and then have back channel discussion uh, on that. So there are lots of these uh, kinds of very interesting tools uh, which can be adopted to, which can help uh, in this knowledge sharing mechanism in the organization. Then you can have your own intranet or portal. Uh, portal is basically a, a knowledge repository for the organization. So initially, if you look at the case studies of knowledge management in the year, from 1990 onwards, you'll find that the most common way of implementing knowledge man management used to be through a portal. And these are not used so much because again, portal was a way to share the explicit knowledge in organization, but they were not very good at communicating the tacit knowledge for people to chat and people to talk whenever they had questions. And then you can also have webinars where you have disseminated information with, with large audiences, like through GoToMeeting or GoToWebinar and so on. Then there are social networking tools, which is social media, Twitter, Facebook, and so on. Uh, tools for video conferencing, uh, tools for 3D immersive collaboration through Second Life, or audio conferencing through, through voice over IP, web conferencing, and multimedia presentation, and so on. And the last phase here is uh, is kind of application and use. So here you'll find that uh, the non-technology tools here are basically doing personality tests for people to see what are the, what are, to understand their learning styles, to see what are the ways in which people use knowledge, doing a knowledge audit. Whenever you want to implement knowledge management, one of the first things you have to do is to do a knowledge audit to understand the ways in which uh, knowledge is being captured, knowledge is being shared, knowledge is being transferred in an organization. So that really helps you identify gaps. Where is knowledge being lost? What are the ways in which people are being lost? And this is this is a very important stage in understanding the knowledge application and use. You can also do personalization and profiling of, of knowledge held by organizations, because rather than doing a one size fits all of library websites, users can provide with personalization profiling based on people's needs. Then you can have taxonomies and classification mechanisms to further further classify that the information and knowledge held. You can do a knowledge review. That's that's basically team members learning working projects can continually learn while carrying up, carrying out a project. And then um, this is the technology tools in the same area. Um, here in this case, you can have content management systems. You can have tools for event scheduling through Doodle and so on. And for tools for locating expertise, tools for project management, and tools for work group or team collaboration workspaces. So then we came up with this uh, research model over here. Uh, uh, the, a theoretical model. Uh, so, in, so in this model, basically what we found is that uh, there is no single set of tools which you can propose to any library to adopt, but the, based on this, these sets of mechanisms and sets of tools, a library can de then pick and choose the ones which, which, uh, which is most useful. And here you'll find that uh, 
there are various services and processes which a library has, for instance, acquisition and uh, circulation technical services, interlibrary loan, and so on. So whenever we, you want to implement knowledge management, you have to first identify the value proposition, saying that what is the problem that you want to solve? So let's say you want to implement knowledge management in, in university, then you have to identify what problem do you want to solve? Let's say there's a problem of student, student retention, that you want to retain the students that, that join the, the, the university, or there's a problem of uh, uh, research productivity, you want your faculty to, to produce more research, so, or you want to get, get your faculty to be excellent in, in teaching. So all of these can be certain goals that you have. So based on a particular goal, you need to implement knowledge management in order to facilitate that goal and to put it in a certain context. So when you want to do that, initially you want to have a small team uh, of a, a small pilot uh, that can take that goal and to then implement knowledge management. And when you look at people, right, there are various people who are comfortable with technology. There are the innovators. Uh, this is based on Roger's model that the innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and, and laggards. So whenever you want to have a, a tool for knowledge management, you have to get the innovators and early adopters first and get them to be comfortable with something and then get the, the rest of the organization to do it. And for the laggards, you need to have uh, uh, some sort of a mechanisms to incentivize them to, to join in this uh, in using the tool. And tools need to be evaluated for the usefulness of the tool as well as the ease of use of the tool. And based on that, then you need to, to have assess the tools for knowledge creation and capture, tools for the sharing and transfer, and tools for application and use. And then you use that as a, to adopt both the technology tools as well as non-technology tools and processes in order to implement knowledge management successfully. So this was one uh, paper. I think a bit looking at the time, I'll just go through the probably one other paper in, in some, uh, and this is a, this is a, this was a paper on how to implement knowledge management in colleges and universities, and it provides a 10-step ten ten template. So the first part really talks about uh, this whole idea of uh, why is knowledge management needed in colleges and universities, and then uh, what knowledge are we seeking to manage, and then the past work, past work in this area on KM in colleges and universities. And a theoretical lens, uh, these are various frameworks for knowledge management implementation. Uh, and this one is from by the American Product Productivity and Quality Center. So where they talk about first doing a call to action for implementing knowledge management, where you have a value proposition, getting the business buy-in for the for knowledge management. Second is coming up with a strategy and roadmap. And the third is designing and launching approaches, coming up with a project plan, infrastructure, and budget. And finally, sustaining and, and evolving. So then uh, there is this very nice, uh, simple framework for knowledge management over here. So Basically, to implement knowledge management, first you need to do, do the planning and then designing, then implementing, and then scaling up. But you need to, some four essential uh, ingredients in order for knowledge management to be successful, which we can call the enabling environment. So one is that you need to have uh, technology tools. Uh, you need to have a good infrastructure, both physical as well as the organizational infrastructure and technological infrastructure for knowledge management. You need to have a knowledge sharing culture in the organization. And also you need to have a set of measures uh, that you develop to see whether knowledge management is successful or not. So then uh, in the set of, uh, in the steps, we came up with this 10 step process to initiate uh, knowledge management. So here, when you come down, um, I'll just, uh, there's, this, this, is a pretty, this is a pretty long paper, but uh, there's, a, there's a nice table in the end. So yeah, so this is also a, a, a very useful uh, figure, I think, because it talks about uh, the culture in an organization so if there is a if there is a knowledge hostile culture where people do not want to share their knowledge, so the so the human interaction is very low in, in an organization. Let's say there is a hallway design, you do not have common shared spaces or common meetings with, between people a lot. Then the then the tools that you propose can be more of a self service way, where you just say that okay, people you provide a tool and then people can use it or not use it based on what they want. And as the human interaction increases, you can have ways for people to transfer their lessons learned. And then uh, when there's a good knowledge sharing culture, then, then you can have more tacit to tacit conversion mechanisms. You can have knowledge communities over there. And uh, when the human interaction is a lot, with, uh, then you can have transfer of best practices. So depending on the kind of culture, you can propose a different sets of tools and approaches to implementing knowledge management. And uh, we, come up, we came up with this 10-step uh, process. Uh, let me come down uh, further over here. So this is a... Uh, a 10-step uh, process for knowledge uh, for knowledge uh, management implementation in, in any setting. So this, in this case, we talk about a university setting. 
So the first phase, which is a KM plan, the first step is basically finding a champion from top administration and forming a KM planning team. So for this, we need to, you need to consult uh, team formation involving various stakeholders. And the outcome of this process is basically a, a buy-in for knowledge management, uh, support and resources, and then you have a planning team that you form. And the second part of the process is basically identifying the goals and priorities. What part of knowledge management do you want to implement? You, then that comes from either for a, a crisis that you perceive or some opportunity that you have. And based on what you do, you align the goals and univers goals of the university uh, with the goals of knowledge management. Because really, uh, you cannot say that I want to go and manage your knowledge. You have to say that what can I do to make your life easier? What can I do to make your organization succeed? Or what can I do to the, the organization to meet its strategic goals? So that is where you need to pick some goal and then use knowledge management to align with that organizational goals. So identify and prioritize the critical knowledge that you need to manage. And for this, you need to consult. Uh, you need to. You can have three or four retreats involving various st stakeholders to in order to come up with this identification of the priorities. So the outcome of this process is basically identification of need and priority areas, and then you come up with your critical knowledge. And then you, at this stage, you basically choose a pilot site because you cannot implement it in the entire organization. You can implement it first in one phase. And then you come up with a design team, including a technology team. And the third, the second part of the, after the planning part is the design part in which there are four steps. The first step is determining your current state in the priority areas. So to determine your current state, right, uh, this determining this is the audit audit part where you see that uh, where do you lie uh, in in terms of uh, of your current management state. So you can do surveys, you can do interviews, you can do focus groups, and the outcome of this phase is basically a relative rating for each priority area. So this is actually a pretty pretty extensive uh, paper, and each of these steps can be various studies. So what Leila and I what we did was that we just took this step three of this paper, and we then developed uh, designed a second study. And which was determining your current state, and I think I can find that study right now. It was it was a pretty uh, interesting study that we did. And uh, let's see if I can uh, find that KM universities. Uh, first, uh, Then maybe it's difficult for me to get it uh, right now. Kevin Universities, yeah, Kevin Universities, and then this we, we call it readiness assessment, basically assessing uh, the extent to which uh, a university uh, is ready for knowledge management, and this is our published version of the paper. So in this study, what we did was that uh, the fa the study was called "Are Faculty Members Ready? Individual fac Factors Assessing Knowledge Management Readiness in Universities." So we looked at uh, various uh, ALA accredited, uh, accredited schools in uh, library and information science programs across the US, and we sent out a survey to to a lot of faculty members. I think we and we got about one about 900 people uh, that we reached out to, and we got 150 responses from people, and we came up with this survey to to assess uh, this idea of uh, KM readiness uh, of people. And this study, uh, this survey is here. And uh, in in this survey study, right, we have uh, this is this is our tool uh, that we came up with. We have this uh, in this instrument, right? We had a factor on trust. I believe colleagues in my college or university are knowledgeable and competent in the area. I believe colleagues in my, my university share the best knowledge that they have. I believe colleagues in my knowledge give credit to other people's knowledge where it is due. So we had this trust instrument, and then we had knowledge self-efficacy. I'm confident in my ability to provide knowledge that others in my college or university consider valuable. Then perceived degree of collegiality. Then we, we demonstrate respect towards each other and so on. Openness for change, reciprocity. When I provide an answer to a to a colleague's question in my college, I believe somebody will provide an answer to my question that I might have. And then based on these, we we felt that these factors, right? Basically, the trust, knowledge, efficacy, collegiality, and uh, and openness for change. So let me get, go to the research model. I think we have a model over here. Yes, yeah, so this was our, our research model. So basically, from these factors, we saw that. All of these factors could determine uh, an individual readiness to participate in a game initiative. And all of this could affect an, the perceived organization readiness to adopt game. So this is just one phase of trying to see whether your organization is ready for knowledge management or not. So, that, so this is the kind of an instrument that can, that can help in the process. So if you go back to our uh, other paper, right? So this was just phase three, basically, determining your current state in an organization, which, and that was a survey that we did uh, in order to see whether schools and colleges are ready or not. 
And then once you do that, right, then you can determining determine the approach to align with the culture and capability to enab enable knowledge flow, determining whether your organization, to the extent to which is ready, you can see what's the best approach. And then you can have meetings, discussions based on survey results, uh, decide on approaches and tools for a pilot site. Then you can come up with measures for success. You can do one or two retreats. You can have a list of measures because you cannot impose any measures. The people who are implementing knowledge management, they, they need to come up with their own measures for success because that's when it will be most useful. And then you can have uh, create an action plan for and then get a faculty or admin to buy in. You can have meetings and update for schools. And uh, finally, when the, in, then you can implement the knowledge management. You can launch a, a pilot site and provide support. And you can have early results. You can have measures of success. And then you can publicize the success stories through storytelling, through interviews, surveys, and videos, through presentation newsletters. And once that works in, in, the organization, in that one pilot, pilot site, then you can scale it up to other sites. So that is uh, that was a, a model that we have for implementing knowledge management, which can be applied to various settings. So we have uh, more studies over here. There was another paper that we did uh, on uh, on uh, this was in ASIS in, in 2016, where we actually took the other the same idea of the KM tools, and we looked at how can that be used by professional organizations, uh, and how can you implement knowledge management in, in professional organizations, and we looked at various types in order to help ASIS and other organizations retain its members, basically, uh, continue to stay relevant. And there was uh, another study where we, uh, let me see, the. this was on the knowledge retention and transfer, where we, uh, what we did was that uh, we looked at what are the ways in which libraries can retain the knowledge uh, which is held by by the by the employees. And we, we did an, an interview and we asked various librarians uh, from from I think from the different countries, we, uh, there were more than uh, 100 people that we asked. 101 academic librarians from 35 countries in six continents. So, so in this case, in this study, we we try to look at various ways in which those libraries uh, implemented to to have these mechanisms. So we had in our finding, I think, we had uh, some tools, various ways in which we captured from the uh, from our study, and we found that uh, libraries provided two ways for for training, networking, training, network, storytelling, library visits, and for externalization, they had documentation, storytelling, and these were the various mechanisms that they had in their study. And in a, in a recent paper uh, that we submitted to ASUS 2018, uh, what we did was that we tried to look at uh, library and information science. Uh, we looked at uh, knowledge management journals, and we tried to find that the extent to which uh, these journals uh, captured uh, LIS, I mentioned LIS uh, studies in the library settings, and we actually found in the study was that uh, out of uh, we, we had, the 83 LIS related articles were found within the 4,600 uh, research articles published in the since in the last 18 years since 2000, and that only 1.8 percent of the KM articles were related to LIS. And so basically, we found that basically LIS has, still has a long way to go before it can establish itself within the KM field. And this, and then in the future study, we intend to look at KM journal LIS journals and to see the extent to which KM is mentioned in in LIS journals. Here we were looking at the extent to which LIS was mentioned in KM journals. So these were some of the some of the work uh, that we've done in knowledge management and uh, how it can be applied. So so that is all uh, that I wanted to cover, and I'm ready for your questions now. Okay, um, let's give uh, Professor Alwell a hand. Okay, any questions? It seems as though the uh, to me the cultural question which you brought up um, whether you that's kind of at the core but whether you have a, a, a knowledge sharing culture or one that's hostile and um, I appreciated that you covered some ground on how to handle the, the, the kind of the hostile environment but that seems almost insurmountable um, in, in my mind at least in, in my experience because um, people have very complicated reasons for why they would or would not be interested in sharing their their knowledge. And I found that uh, the way to circumvent the hostility part, right, is, is that you have to look for three kinds of people in, in any organization. You have to look for people who are very enthusiastic and people who would want to share readily what they know. And there will always be some people like that in any organization. And there will be some people who will be hostile to sharing will be very resistant to change. And there will be a majority of people who will follow along based on whatever the majority is doing. 
So yeah. in order to bring about any change management, so I see knowledge management as, as an essential part, is basically change management in a way. So you need to look at the innovators and people who are enthusiastic people, and you have to rope them in first. And hopefully you will have one such people in the top administration in, in which we can find a champion such that. And if you're able to find some champion in the top administration, right, then you can bring about initially the recruit, recruit the enthusiastic people and get them to do some sort of a pilot implementation of knowledge management. And once you see some success over here, here right, then you can rope in the, the majority of people and then focus on the on the hostile people at the end. And then you can have uh, some sort of a stick and carrot approach in terms of a reward mechanism for sharing and some sort of in, disincentive for not, not for not sharing. And that is where the, the hostile people will then fall into line uh, in terms of trying to the, I think fall into line is the wrong word basically. Uh, we we'll see the value, I think, in terms of, of sharing. People do, people do start seeing the benefit of sharing after a while. Once they see that sharing is beneficial, and they and they start uh, uh, and, and and they start seeing how how useful, uh, how much easier their life becomes once people get used to this idea of sharing. But right. you also need to have other other ways in which, for instance, every time people share, right, there needs to be a credit attached to the sharing. So they're saying that this person has shared because sometimes the credit is lost and people don't want to share. So, so those, those are simple things in which we, which need to be noted in terms of incentivizing sharing. Well, I mean, and the, the domains I think would be each have their specific challenge. In academia, um, credit will take one form, and a corporate environment, credit will take a very different form. Yes, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 um, no, that's true. Yeah, and you have to decide on what these credits and approaches are for each organization, and it's best if people come up with these on their own through retreats and talking and brainstorming. Uh, this is Jay. Can I ask a question? Sure, Jay. Yes. Yeah. I'll turn my camera on so you can see me. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Um, I was really intrigued by the point that you made about how it's not just about the people and the technology, but how the spaces that they embody can affect what's going on. And I was wondering if you or any other researchers had looked at if changing spaces uh, along with trying to implement the technology and the processes of knowledge management had made the process go more smoothly or changed its success? Yes, I think I think it, people recognize that those people who implement knowledge management, they recognize the importance of space a lot. And uh, right now we are, uh, SLIS, uh, Simmons College is also going through a reorganization and we will be there. SLIS uh, is looking to move into the current uh, management of the business building uh, in, in one or two years time. And, and space is a big consideration for us in terms of what are the current, let's say even the, the room that you're, the people are sitting, sitting in right now, the collaboratory, whether we can have this uh, same room and other similar spaces over there. So the space design is actually uh, um, one of the big things that we have, questions that we are thinking right now is, uh, let's say Simmons uh, with SLIS is forming, uh, is part of a new college called COSIS, right, which is a college of uh, organizational information and, uh, and computational sciences. So there when you have uh, COSIS, right, whether SLIS uh, faculty should sit next to each other or be in the same floor or in the same space, or should SLIS and, and business faculty, should they be, be mingled together and have offices next to each other? And that's a big consideration uh, as to which of these uh, goes, goes into. When we think of uh, the undergraduate department, let's say the, uh, the computer science and math, right? Whether they, whether they, since they are a part of courses, whether they should be close, closer to, to other courses faculty or whether they should be close to other undergrad faculty and how they can be linked, that is a big consideration. So I see that even, so this discussion is happening within within Simmons. And I think any any person who designs uh, organizations and, and strategic environments, right, they do they give a lot of thought to this in terms of how the co-location of spaces can have a big impact on the kind of uh, collaboration and communication that you want to facilitate in any organization. Thanks. Um, okay, so we in the beginning we in this class we learned about the DRKW hierarchy. Um, a lot of things that you talked about in terms of knowledge management, we, we could even also say it's more information level. So I guess the fundamental question is how how does it make uh, a knowledge management not information management? Um, is that actually the applied knowledge we're addressing, not necessarily, um, you know, the other, you know, sort of applied expertise, not necessarily, are they at the level not at the not equivalent to information? And David Lankus 
from South Carolina, actually, when he moved to South Carolina from Syracuse, he, he's now the director of South Carolina. So he said that his school uh, is not going to be an information school. His school is going to be a knowledge school. And why is that really, is that one level up? Is that equivalent to information school? And then there's also right now we have, you know, a lot of data science, big data discussion. So I guess, you know, the fundamental question is, is there a, a clear boundary of, you know, um, that differentiate knowledge management from any kind of other kind of management, such as information management and data management? Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's also this, I mean, to me, if you say knowledge management is really organizational learning, that if it's organizational, contextual based, you know, really bonded kind of, you know, it's not, you know, it's not generalizable. So, uh, so for instance, you know, uh, Kathy Wizard uh, told me just a few days ago to say, okay, you have all the things about PhD in your head. Um, so it's, uh, you know, because I'm the director of the doctoral program. Um, so is that the knowledge I have about the Celeste doctoral program is not going to be, I mean, there's some similarity, but it's not entirely suitable for other doctoral program which may have really different structure. So if it's not generalizable knowledge, um, I think this, this, this definition of knowledge needs to be really clear because to me, it's not just any kind of knowledge. It is bounded by the organization. Uh, there's context um, uh, defining it. Uh, if it's out of context, this knowledge may not be worthwhile anymore. So, you know, yes, I, I, I know I'm yeah. Yeah. wrong. I, you bring up a uh, very interesting and important <laughs> things. Uh, and uh, I, I'll address the second part first, uh, which is the idea of uh, context, right? And I, and I, and I discussed that a lot uh, in this book on, on exploring context and information behavior. And I use uh, one definition by Paul Durish over here, where he talks about the idea of uh, Context is not something which is out there, which is existing, but which is created at a moment in time out of the interaction that we have. So for every interaction or for every behavior or activity, right, there is a certain context associated with it it's in terms of the, the sources, the people, the setting, everything. So when we think of knowledge management, right, even though the, the knowledge which, let's say, the wrong has about the, the SLIS doctoral program, right, that knowledge is, uh, is important and people, and this idea comes in in terms of knowledge, knowledge retention and transfer. But the extent to which that knowledge is used will be applicable to different contexts at different points in time because new questions and new needs will arise and it will not be the same way in which it has been used in the past. So that knowledge uh, ha has to be used as a resource, not as a solution. Because that solution, it, that knowledge as well as some other needs and some other knowledge from other sources will have to be taken into consideration to fix a unique problem that will, have, that will come at that future date at a, at a point in time. So one of the terms used over here is the idea of a teachable moment. So a teachable moment is basically when I need some information, let's say at 2 a.m. at night, and it's a, it's a problem with Moodle that I might be facing. So even though Moodle might have a resource over there, I do not know where to click on it at that moment. Maybe I may not know. But teachable moment is, is a moment where, where I have the, the right access to the person as well as the tools and, and the resources when I need it in that particular context. So yes, I think the knowledge will all, there will always be new contexts about knowledge, knowledge reuse. And that is where that idea of divesting also comes in where certain information or knowledge held in the past may not be applicable anymore. Or you, or you purposely decide that we are expecting, we are investing too much into that past knowledge. Like I think we decided once to, to let's say that, to get rid of MLIP uh, wrong in terms uh -huh. of the program, right? Because that was a that was something that we had as, as a program, which we felt that we did not want to sustain anymore into the future. So organizations always make that sort of a, of a consideration at different points in time as to what part of your knowledge are you willing to divest. And the earlier point uh, which wrong made was very interesting on this whole idea of uh, the distinction between uh, data and information and knowledge and wisdom and then entire related fields based on that, uh, which is data management and knowledge management and information management. And uh, one interesting th thing that I like to look at is, uh, is Derwin's research, because uh, the way Derwin defined information, right, she said uh, that information is not something which is existing outside of a person. 
information is something which exists at a point in time as in the way it is understood by an actor or, or a user at a, at a given point in time. So I think Derwin uh, probably got, got uh, Derwin was carrying on with her own research for about a decade or more. And then people in the knowledge management field were carrying on their own research. And there was a very interesting article that I read where she wrote, she talked about uh, knowledge management and she discovered that what people in the knowledge management field were using to define knowledge, she in her own way was using to define information. Yeah. And and it was it and it was a very similar approaches, a very similar way of looking at information. So she was using it, it as a term information, whereas the knowledge management people were, were using it as a term knowledge. And I like to look at it uh, in terms of tacit knowledge versus explicit knowledge. So maybe the term tacit knowledge is closer to the term knowledge, and the term explicit knowledge is closer to, to the term information in the way in which it is uh, codified in, in books and manuals and in repositories. So yeah. and wrong is right in the sense that whichever way you do it, right, you need to from an organizational point of view, you need to have a clear definition of it. And that definition, again, cannot be imposed. It is what people in, in a unit or organization need to agree upon. Because knowledge management is not useful, is, is not of any value if it is not useful. So it has to be based on a certain application or use for decision making and for future directions in order to uh, to take the organization goals further. So so, they in, so based on that, that unit or, or, an, or an organization can come up with their own definition of the way in which they understand knowledge. And then use that to in order to, because that knowledge can be maybe not any knowledge, but knowledge that is applicable to a certain context. Let's say knowledge that is applicable to the doctoral program in SLIS. And based on that knowledge, then again, you can uh, use that to see, to come up to chart the future directions or goals of the doctoral program, for instance. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> Um, I, I have to, uh, so you have to probably transfer the organizer back to me because we are going to stay with this. Uh, uh, I will do that. I will, do that right. I will give you back the. So you can. Uh, transfer the knowledge organizer's role. Yep. Thank you. I'm recording and then we'll just, uh, you can log off. We, we will stay yes, with I, you. I will do that wrong, yeah.